usually using PCs instead of Macs, so thanks for your patience. Um, my name is Leanne Long, and I'll be talking about the Black Hawk Lake watershed and some of the monitoring that we've been doing up there these last three years since 2015. And this is as part of the National Water Quality Initiative, um, a subsection of the EPA's 319 funding that's been, um, not only is it in place to put, practice, put conservation practices in place, but there's also some money available for monitoring. And it's not just me who's been working on this. Um, but I have a really fantastic team to work with, um, Dr. Michelle Sapir from um, Iowa State University and other colleagues, Matt Helmers, Amy Kalita. Um, we have a couple of graduate students, some of them are in attendance today, um, Tim Nahir and uh, Conrad Brendel and Catherine Brander Woody. And then also uh, in conjunction with uh, DNR staff from the Watershed Improvement Division, Alan Benini and Jason Palmer and formerly Charles Eikenberry, who's now with Fire Engineering. Um, and then also I want to give credit to T.J. Lynn, who's in the back here, the watershed coordinator for the Black Hawk Lake project, who's really on the ground working with the landowners, getting conservation practices in place to protect the watershed and the, the lake itself. Um, our funding, as I mentioned, is from the U.S. EPA Region 7, Section 319 funds. We've also received some money from the Iowa Water Center uh, to do some of this work. Um, Need to give some uh, also additional uh, acknowledgement to uh, the fisheries biologists at Black Hawk Lake, Ben Wallace, our local landowners, who some of which are allowing us access to the property, and then uh, a bunch of student technicians, and then also the Sac County Engineer and Secondary Roads Departments, because some of our monitoring sites are in the right of way there. Uh, Black Hawk Lake is located in some people would call it Northwest Iowa, some people would call it West Central Iowa. Um, the watershed spans Sac and Carroll counties, uh, although the lake itself is located in Sac County near the uh, town of Lakeview here. Uh, Black Hawk Lake is a natural lake. It's our southernmost um, glacial lake. It's very shallow. Uh, overall average depth is about six feet and um, it's about 960 acres in size. Very important locally to the um, economy. Uh, for tourism and recreation purposes. It's classified as a primary contact recreation lake. So swimming, boating, fishing. Um, the state has property um, around on the sides of the lake. So Black Hawk Lake State Park is on, on the lake. And then there's also a fair amount of um, urban development too surrounding the lake, vacation homes and whatnot. The watershed itself is about 13,000 acres, so 5,000 hectares. Um, Watershed to lake ratio is about 14 to 1. This is a good watershed to lake ratio in terms of seeing improvements to the water quality in the lake from improvements that are happening in the watershed. Um, typical land use for Iowa, so primarily corn and soybean production. Um, fun fact about this part of Iowa, there's a lot of popcorn production here. So, but that's, it's considered corn um, in terms of agronomic practices. Um, some permanent vegetation in terms of hay, grass, wetlands, um, and other timber. And then there's uh, also some urban development. So there's the town of Greta here, which is about 500 people. There's an un unincorporated village in the middle of the watershed called Carnivan, um, with maybe 100 people or so. The town of Wall Lake is just off to the, the uh, outside of the watershed boundary, and then Lakeview is about uh, 1,300 people. And then, as I mentioned, there's an active watershed restoration project been going on since about 2012 or so. And there's been a lot of work in the lake itself. So in addition to the improvements that are happening in the watershed, there's also been a lot of work being done within the lake in terms of improving um, the biology of the lake itself. So they've done some fish renovations. Uh, we're able to take advantage of the drought of 2012 to draw down the lake water, um, remove all the rough fish that are stirring up the bottom sediments, and redistributing the um, total, or redistributing sediment and phosphorus. So the lake has been on the um, 303D list as an impaired lake for um, phosphorus and sediment impairment. Um, also a little bit on bacteria, but we won't be going into that here. So what I'm gonna be talking about is what we're doing in the upper watershed in order to analyze water quality and quantity trends in three of the sub-watersheds within the larger Black Hawk Lake watershed. 
Uh, this is going to complement existing monitoring that's being done by the watershed improvement uh, branch of the DNR. So Jennifer Kurth, who just spoke about muscles, um, has a hand in that, along with Jason Palmer. Um, they, I know, are monitoring some of these red triangle sites here, and then that's going to complement the uh, monitoring that we're doing in this watershed 8, 11, and 12. And then there's yellow stars here. We're monitoring at the um, at the um, outflow of each of those watersheds there. And then the objective of this particular part of the monitoring is to determine if strategies to reduce sediment and nutrient loads, best management practices, have these been effective or not. So again, our monitoring, monitoring locations, we're monitoring in watersheds, sub-watersheds of the larger watershed that have had varying amounts of best management practices applied. Um, so some of these are cover crops, um, permanent grass plantings in terms of CRP, uh, nutrient management plans um, for manure application, grass waterways, and such. And so here's the map that we uh, were provided by the DNR at the start of the monitoring project, so 2014. And then there have been some changes in the last few years um, as people have either adopted or uh, declined to continue to adopt cover crops and then some other permanent um, best management practices. So that we are able to take advantage of the uneven distribution of the implementation to look at some, some paired watersheds here. So again, we've got terraces and grass waterways, cover crops in varying portions of the watershed, different tillage practices, um, some um, conservation or uh, CRP property there, stream mix stabilization, and there's even a crep wetland located in the watershed here. So looking specifically at the individual sub-watersheds, so the sub-watershed 8, we're monitoring where that yellow star is. Um, it's a really neat location here because not only are we able to monitor this 36 inch diameter uh, drainage district tile, uh, we are also able to monitor overland flow on, off of this grass waterway. So we've built a uh, weir here to constrain flow and during high flow events we're able to, to sample that location. And in this watershed, it's got relatively few BMPs. Um, we're looking at these only on an aerial um, extent, but there's grass waterways, nutrient management, um, terraces, and cover crops. But not, except for the grass waterways, those other BMPs aren't close to our monitoring location. Subwatershed 11 is a smaller watershed. It's about 560 acres, 570 acres. Um, we're not able to do a paired surface and tile monitoring at this location. This watershed is likely tile fed, as most of our central Iowa watersheds are. Um, but we don't have access to that tile. But from aerial photography um, exploration, it's about at the end of the, the top picture there. It's about at the end of the ground, at the end of the grass waterway there is where the tile daylights. Uh, we're monitoring the, just the surface water here underneath the road in a culvert, so we have a, a hard control structure there. Um, there's some BMP implementation in this watershed, but we're considering it a low BMP implementation, so 30% of the area. None of that um, best management, none of those best management practices are close to the stream though, or so close to where we are monitoring here. They're all up in the upper part of that sub-watershed. Um, the crap wetland though is just downstream. And then the pair for that subwatershed 11 is the subwatershed 12. So it's similar in size, about 550 acres. Um, but what's different here, and it's got similar topography and soils, but what's interesting here is that on an aerial coverage, we have about 88% coverage of best management practices. Terraces, no-till, nutrient monitoring, but then there's this also 40 acres of permanent grass cover there. We are also able to monitor the tile and the surface at this site. So this is also tile fed. Um, 
but we're not monitoring that one directly. We're monitoring the district tile across the road that's 15 inches in diameter, but we're able to, to sum those two sites together to get load estimates for the entire subwatershed. Uh, our monitoring, so we've done three years of monitoring, 2015, 16, and 17. We're monitoring during the warm months of the year, so now about through mid-November. Um, even though the tiles may flow at this time or in the winter, um, our electronic equipment just isn't sensitive or it isn't sturdy enough to handle the cold temperatures. Um, we're using automated ISCO, uh, automated samplers. Um, we also collect grab samples as a backup in case we have a problem with our samplers. We're also monitoring water level and velocity and collecting that data with uh, modules here and also looking at precipitation data. We're separating this out into storm flow and base flow or what we call weekly flow weighted. You'll see that referenced on some of the graphs here. Um, a storm event is considered any uh, event in which there's precipitation that increases the flow by 50% from the base flow. And our samples are being analyzed for suite of nutrients, uh, nitrate, ammonia, total nitrogen, total and dissolved phosphorus, and total and volatile suspended solids. I'm going to be presenting, me presenting just nitrate, total phosphorus, and total suspended solids data. In these um, watersheds, we're monitoring total nitrogen and ammonia, we've determined that most of that total nitrogen is actually in the form of nitrate. So over the three years, we've had some really interesting precipitation patterns, uh, which reflects then on the data that I'll present. Um, so 2015 is this blue line here. This was a record year for precipitation in the subwatershed, or in the watershed. Um, and that's reflected in the, the, the nutrient loading data. 2016 and 17 were more average years uh, in terms of precipitation, although 2017 we had some stretches here in the late summer where it was awfully, awfully dry. Um, we didn't have flow at some of our sites there, but then they come out to be pr pretty average at the end of the year. In terms of nitrate export, so I'll be showing three slides here that are going to look very similar. One is nitrate, one is total phosphorus, and one is sediment export. Uh, showing the three years of data, so 15, 16, and 17, the three watersheds, 8, 11, and 12, and then we've got these bars here showing kilograms of nitrate as expressed in the form of nitrogen per hectare. Uh, that's similar to pounds per acre. Then it's separated into what we consider storm flow, and what we consider base flow. So storm flow is the purple bars, base flow is the yellow bars, and then the percentage of the contribution by each of those to the overall nitrate export for the year are expressed on the bar. So for 2015, our really high precipitation year, we have exceedingly amount of more nitrate being exported from these sub from these subwatersheds than in the more average rainfall years. Subwatershed 11 that has the fewest best management practices is always the largest contributor of the three. And the other thing to note here is that most of the nitrate is being carried by base flow. We've got similar trends in terms of the different watersheds for total phosphorus export. Again, a lot of phosphorus being carried off in that exceedingly wet year. Subwatershed 11 is always the highest contributor of the three subwatersheds. But in terms of contribution from storm flow versus base flow, most of the total phosphorus is being carried off in storm flow, with the exception of subwatershed 12, where we have more permanent cover, and then we have some that's, also the, that's being contributed by base flow. And since phosphorus and sediment are closely related, because phosphorus is bound to sediment, if you remove sediment, you're also generally removing phosphorus. Our trends for sediment export are also the same. So the thing to note here, that's different from the other two slides. Our y-axis is on a logarithmic scale. Um, storm flow is the primary driver 
of our sediment expert here. Again, subwatershed 12 is a little more balanced between storm and base flow in terms of contribution. What we found, though, in these um, with these storm events is that single events, so one or two events that are really early on in the season before you have a lot of crop growth, they can really overwhelm the whole annual sediment and phosphorus loads. So for example, um, there was an event in um, late June in 2015 that in the subwatershed 11 that has few best management practices, 68% of the whole annual sediment losses just happened from that one event. And in 2016, there was a different one rainfall event that contributed about 78% of the sediment losses from that watershed for that year. For the surface water in subwatershed 12, we had a event at the end of April in 2015 that contributed about 69% of the total phosphorus losses in one event and then looking at the two-year data here, we haven't looked at the 2017 data with that, but 62% of the whole export from the two-year period was also just contributed from this one event. Now I'll have two slides here that show the relationships of nutrients, and set, uh, nutrients to the flow patterns that happen here. So the x-axis here is a flow exceeded percentage. So high flows happen at around 0%, 0 of the flows exceed this point here at 100%. These are dry conditions. So this red line matches the flow patterns. Uh, and we've tied this for nitrate, tied it to the drinking water standard, although that's not necessarily um, exactly correct because these are not necessarily drinking water sources. But in absence of any other nutrient criteria, we're using 10 parts per million nitrate. Um, then we have paired the surface drain sites, so high best management practices versus low, so 12 versus 11. And then the tile sites, 8 versus 12, so again, low best management practice, aerial coverage versus high. Uh, the things to note here then, for the high best management practices, whether it's in the surface or in the tile, we're either at or below that uh, target nitrate load standard. For the um, low best management practices, we're above that 10 part per million standard. And then we also then plot this again for total phosphorus. So the flow patterns are the same. Instead of 10 parts per million nitrate, we're using um, 0.05 milligrams of P per liter uh, as our standard, uh, and that's considered the EPA's, um, I don't think it's been adopted, but a federal standard for freshwaters feeding lakes. Um, again, the same four graphs here. Um, this is a little bit messier uh, because it's a little less predictable whether you've got phosphorus moving um, in the tile drainage, the high best management practices are generally below that target line, whereas they aren't necessarily in the tile line that has low best management practices, and then it's a little less clear for the surface drainage. So wrapping up here, because I know it's almost lunchtime, um, if you look at the two similarly sized watersheds, and we're going to leave S8 out of, or the subwatershed 8 out of this for the moment. Um, over the three years, for nitrate, we had 280 kilograms of hectare delivered, 36% less in the watershed that has more best management practices. For total phosphorus, we had about 39% less total phosphorus delivered where we have more best management practices. And then here's the, the really big number here, and a lot of this happened during 2015 where we had a lot more rainfall and a lot more erosion. We had nearly 3,900 kilograms per hectare of erosion happening in that subwatershed 11, and 95% less happening in the watershed that had best management practices. So some other conclusions here. So as 
the data has shown here for these three years of the five-year project, precipitation and flow are the driving force behind our analyte concentrations. <coughs> Nitrates carried primarily by base flow, total phosphorus and sediment carried by storm flow. Single storm events can really overwhelm these annual load for phosphorus and sediment. Total phosphorus concentrations can frequently exceed the EPA limit of 0.05 milligrams of P per liter in surface waters. But the best management practices are effective in reducing total phosphorus and sediment losses in both surface and drainage waters, more so in the surface. The siting of the uh, best management practices may make a difference, so at 12 we're monitoring near the, conservation, the CRP planting, whereas in 11 we're away from all of the BMPs there, and so, and we're also then not able to, to clarify which BMPs, whether it's cover crops or terraces or permanent grass cover, which ones of these are having the greatest contribution. So I'll take any questions and then let's go eat. This is our favorite uh, lunch spot when we go up to the monitor. Morgan. It's a little hard, and we've been trying to figure that out. Um, we'd really love to get a hold of some aerial photography taken in the spring a few days after a rainstorm event. Um, we haven't done that yet, been able to do that yet. Um, what's publicly available just doesn't ho have those conditions. But yeah, we're making some assumptions that it is similarly drained because the soils are similar. Yeah. Yes. That's a good question, and I don't necessarily have an exact answer for you. Um, some of it may have to do with the amount of dissolved phosphorus, so dissolved phosphorus that's also being delivered, and we're starting to look into what the ratio of dissolved phosphorus to total phosphorus is. necessarily have that information. We might be able to get a hold of some of that. Uh, we do know that there's a fair amount of manure applied in this watershed. Um, there's a lot of beef production up here. There's some swine production um, and a lot of that is surface applied or well injected or applied as normally. Um, are you monitoring stream banks at all? Not here, no. But there's been some stream bank stabilization work that's been done in conjunction with watershed improvement. The monitoring site on Subwatershed 12 is downstream from the Krupp Wetland? Uh, 12, no, there, uh, it's 11. 11 is upstream of the Krupp Wetland. Oh, okay. So Thank actually, you. so these, this large amount of loss is probably then mitigated by the Krupp Wetland. Does Dr. Crumpton have any data from that site? Is he monitoring that? Because that would be really interesting. I know it would be, but yeah. not, that's not one that he's have monitoring. Have you talked to him? Uh, about that, yeah. have we, Michelle? I've talked to him. Okay. It's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else? Do, yeah. Does um, popcorn production like require similar methods to regular corn production and similar similar nutrient? Levels? Yes, it does. Yeah. Anybody else? All right. Thanks, Leanne. We appreciate it.